Okay, we will go ahead and start this fantastic webinar. Hello, everyone. My name is Jack. I will be the host for the webinar today. Welcome. Hopefully, you all had a nice fall break last week. <clears throat> Hopefully, you stayed safe. All right, so we will go ahead with the webinar. I am thrilled, just thrilled, to have David here with us as our presenter. He has just an incredible background, uh, just a wealth of resources and knowledge. He knows this topic backward and forward. And so we're going to be talking about literary str liter literacy strategies that you can do at home. Dave is a former teacher. <laughs> and then transferred to over to being a principal at the high school level and now is here uh, with CSD in core working on curriculum and outreach as well as developing resources for our core curriculum. So his background is just amazing from ECE to being a high school principal just everything that he's seen <clears throat> has been amazing. So it's just really exciting to have him here to hear about what kind of strategies we can use from, for literacy that apply to kids from the time their early, early childhood all the way through high school. So David is gonna be able to give you the A to Z as well as the B, C, and D for all of these strategies. And of course, CORE's goal is to share the things that we have, right? Not just amongst our supervisors, but this wealth of knowledge that we have is, is ours to share with the community. Um, and remember, we had uh, Julie Ramsmario a couple of weeks ago. Um, I want you to know the voiceover for that is still in the works. We had some technical difficulties. Um, however, she was talking about educators, deaf educators specifically having a wealth of knowledge and having this wealth of cultural competency to share. And that's another example of the kind of thing that we want to be able to bring out to all of you out in the community. And it ties very nicely into what David is going to talk about in terms of the literacy strategies, especially talking about things we can do from home, you know. <clears throat> Sometimes you have kids running up to you in the middle of a session like this, and sometimes it's a cat or a dog, but uh, it's something that being at home, we're all learning to deal with. Now, our webinars are all downloadable. And before we begin, I just want to do a quick check and make sure that you all can hear the interpreters. Do you all who are relying on the voice interpretation, are you able to hear it? If you could please just confirm in the chat box that we are good to go. Fantastic. Okay, thank you all so much. And I do want to just let you know, this is not captioned. So you'll see two or three things happening here. You will see the in ASL on the webinar. And then for those of you who are not fluent in ASL, you'll be able to listen to the English. And then we're also have for our Spanish speaking families, a toggle button on the interpretation for Spanish interpretation. So this and all of our past webinars are going to be on our Outreach YouTube channel under Webinar Series 2020. So all the webinars are there except for the one that we just had. Um, November 20th, we're waiting for the voiceover to be re-recorded and then we will post that one and we appreciate your patience and your participation to this point. So now we will go ahead with Dave. Dave, thank you and take it away. Oh, one more thing. So Dave's going to go all the way through the presentation and then at the end I will come back and I will translate all of the questions that you type into the Q&A box, not the chat. 
The chat is for general dialogue, conversation, but if you have a question for Dave about the, the content, please put that in the Q&A box and then I'll read that from top to bottom. Uh, if we go to 11, 1105, something like that, if there's questions at the end that we weren't able to do live, we will send those to Dave by email to answer. Okay? All right, so take it away, Dave. Hello, everyone. I am so happy to be here. <laughs> you know, CSD has been around for decades. We've had a lot of people come through our doors in terms of students, families. And so we've got this wealth of information that we want to share with you. You know, the core team is just fantastic. They've done a lot of great work. And so I am bringing forward and representing the work of an entire team. And so uh, <laughs> I'm figuring out the technology. So please be patient with me while I get myself set up here. I think I got the wrong one. Okay, are we on the right screen? We are, all right. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about literary strategies. And this has been designed by looking at what's going on with deaf families and students around California. And there's been a lot of borrowing and loaning of information between institutions. So this is things that we can do both at home and at school. So let me ask you, when do deaf children start fingerspelling? When do you think? Do you think it's very early? It is, it is very early. Deaf children start signing at around eight months. <clears throat> Finger spelling comes at about 13 months. Now this is really interesting because you know, we'll talk, we'll compare this to how uh, hearing speaking children develop language. And we'll talk about how this uh, relates to language deprivation when uh, hearing parents or when parents of deaf kids don't sign and <clears throat> the children have to wait for school interventions. But <clears throat> the idea is that deaf children start to understand what's this visual envelope. And one of my favorite stories is from a galaxy far, far away and a long time ago when I was teaching. There was a student who was about five years old and we were practicing writing and the student came to me and said, excuse me, how do you spell bus and finger spelled in a, a lexicalized finger spelling manner, B-U-S. Didn't sign bus with an initialization, didn't finger spell letter by letter B-U-S, but did it, signed it as a word because they understood this envelope, this visual envelope. <laughs> And so they asked, the teacher, they asked me, how do you spell bus? And I said, well, try spelling it really slow. Can you try that? Try doing those hand shapes slow. And they looked at their own hand and said B-U-S and just had this amazing moment of realization. And it all sort of came into view all at once. And they realized that that related to the words and the letters that they were writing on the page. And so, you know, a lot of parents and teachers say, you know, oh, well, we should wait on fingerspelling and teach it later because it's too hard. But the evidence and the anecdotal evidence and the actual evidence all says, do it now. They can do it. They can understand it and they can grasp it. Now, I don't totally love these labels of ASL and non-ASL. You know, there are children who don't use sign. There's people who use their voice, you know, you know non-ASL people, generally hearing people. And ASL people are usually deaf. However, this ASL child thing applies also to CODAs, children of deaf adults. But let's take a look at these sort of as a hearing deaf model for the purposes of this discussion. Children begin to speak at about 10 months. 
right? Just in general. The first sign tends to come at about eight months. Now, why is that disparity there? What's behind that? <laughs> you know, assuming language exposure and policy is the same, this is really a modality issue, right? <laughs> Kids are born, they start pointing, gesturing, indicating things in their environment. However, that vocal tract development, <laughs> once, it's, once they start speaking, children who speak tend to drop the hand part, the gesture part, the indexing a lot of the time. But for deaf kids or for signing kids, that pointing and gesturing becomes sign language. And so at eight months, the gesturing deaf kids are ahead of the hearing speaking kids. And then when they get about to the age two, they're sort of on the same level and they progress in the same manner. But it also depends on the linguistic environment. How are the families involved? How is communication being done around these children? But assuming that those are the same, they get to the age of two and then they sort of develop in parallel. And you can see there at 24 months, they're basically about the same in terms of how many vocabulary items they have, et cetera. And, you know, they may, so that, you know, one point one's ahead at the other point, another is ahead, but they get to eight, two years old and they're basically in the same place. And again, this is assuming similar language policy, right? Or similar language environment. <laughs> you know, the hearing person is in an environment where they're mostly getting <clears throat> Uh, oral and oral language access without print, and then the deaf kid is in the environment where there is sign language uh, rather than spoken language. And again, so what we're really talking about is given the same uh, linguistic environment or the same appropriate linguistic environment, the brain develops the same way. So again, we're gonna look at, I'm gonna show you some examples of what literacy looks like in uh, skilled deaf readers uh, in some videos that I'm gonna show you here. <laughs> so here's a very young child, uh, this child's parents sign, and these are early reading behaviors and early signing behaviors that you can see here. And what you'll notice is that the child is turning the pages. There we go. And so you'll see the child uh, here exhibiting some early signing behaviors, trying to tell the story, pointing at things and saying what they are. Even though these aren't signs that are well formed enough for someone who maybe isn't the child's parent to fully grasp what they're saying out of context. So, as you can see, the child already understands left from right is able to turn the pages back and forth, looks down, isn't necessarily reading the English, right? But recognizes that there are words, maybe can't read them per se, but knows that there are words there and also recognizes the picture. So that's early literacy. So let's look at a slightly older child. <laughs> and the Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle doesn't have words, but there are signs this child is going to tell the story anyway. He's saying the caterpillar looks sick. Caterpillar has an upset tummy. The caterpillar got fat. He's a caterpillar, then becomes a butterfly. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Sorry, okay. Here we are. So we saw the baby, the first sort of babbling and early literacy, early signing behaviors. Then we saw the older child who was, I believe, three years old. Trav is about three years old at the time. Now, there's no words in the book that he's looking at, but he's adding and telling the story and describing it. <laughs> and now this next kid we'll look at is five years old and is going to be reading, actually reading the print. Oof. Sorry. So I'll expand on some of the skills that we saw here in both ASL and English. We'll talk about some of the literacy skills and how those strategies work in parallel. So first, fingerspelling. Fingerspelling, obviously. Now I'm going to ask you all to think about if I spell this word E-N-G-L-I-S-H. Is that in English or ASL? If I fingerspell this word, one second, let me just make sure we've got the right slide. One second, we're going to stop sharing. We're going to hold on that for a second. So if I finger, finger spell this, E-N-G-L-I-S-H, is that English or ASL? What do you think? Some people are saying ASL. And right, because I am using ASL. But I'm using ASL to represent English, right? And so that, right, it's ASL, but there is room within ASL to represent English. And that's how highly skilled literate deaf people do this. So let me get back to the screen sharing. It was bedtime soon, and the five little monkeys took a bath and washed their hair. And you see, she's expanding on what a bath means. She's, it says bath, but she's showing the bath. And after the bath, the five little monkeys put on their pajamas.
And after they put on their pajamas, the five little monkeys brushed their teeth. And you see, again, it just said brush teeth, but she's showing the spitting and the whole action of brushing their teeth. Then the five little monkeys Okay, so you'll notice that English said something like pajamas, the full word pajamas, but she signed PJs, right? Which is also a common England rep English representation, <laughs> right? PJs. And you see this rhythm, five little monkeys. And that's repeated again and again, five little monkeys. It's not five little monkeys, it's five little monkeys. There's a rhythm to it that's very noticeable. And again, this is a representation of the English in ASL. So now we're on the fingerspelling slide. Great. Okay. So we talked about this idea of PJs to represent pajamas. And so you can see these word sign pairs here, right? We know the sign social worker, PJs, APT, apartment, right? It's a, it's a, a shortening of apartment, right, to APT. Amazon, Amazon gets uh, lexicalization in the finger spelling. Pizza, right, you can see these different ways that uh, finger spelling and English letters represented through finger spelling are incorporated into ASL signs. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Sometimes you do a sign with a finger spelling or a finger spelling with a sign to represent a compound word in English or the idea of a compound word in English. But again, this is a range of strategies used by highly literate signers. Right? The point is start finger spelling early. Start it before school. Start it before kindergarten. Start it before introducing printed English. ASL incorporates finger spelling and finger spelled hand shapes. You know, you're telling people they're having rice for lunch. Whatever it is, you use that finger spelling. We use finger spelling all day. And it doesn't have to be introduced after you introduced English. It can, sh it, it, it does show that represent English in ASL, but it is also in itself ASL. So introducing finger spelling along with the rest of language development is good enough. It's awesome. <laughs> so let's talk about sandwiching. Here you would finger spell, show a sign and finger spell or sign, finger spell the English vocabulary and then show the sign again. So this is a technique for introducing English vocabulary. So you can see here, the sign tornado, then the finger spelling tornado, and then the sign tornado. So there's one example. And then here's the reverse, giving the finger spelling, then the sign, and then the finger spelling again. So here's much and now go, the sign for go, another sign for go, and the finger spelling G-O. Good, the sign for good, and the finger spelling for the English G-O-O-D. New, new, N-E-W. And what's fascinating about this, it's sandwiching, but it's also showing, you, you saw there were two signs for go. There's go, G-O, as a lexicalized finger spelling. There's go, there's go, and then there's G-O as just sort of the straight finger spelling. So you can take a look at this chaining. California, California involves this pointing. School for the deaf. So I'll show you another example of chaining, but it's indicating the text. So you can see sort of this chart that we have here. 
it involves a picture, it involves the printed word, the finger spelling, maybe a news story. So you can think about the problem with, you know, inventing signs for every English word, right? You don't want to invent signs for every English word. <laughs> You know, you can't, and, and even if I, you know, come up with something, I can't make it spread to everyone. Maybe 10 people will use it, or maybe you'll get a community of users, but how language develops, you know, these things have to come out. And you just have parents inventing signs for things sometimes too, and kids do that and they get to school and no one knows what they're talking about, so they replace it with fingerspelling until they get the right sign. And so the fingerspelling helps, also helps with sign fluency. The good news for parents is you don't have to be completely fluent signers for your children to be successful. What's important is that you're able to show and represent and have a connection with them and show love and care and build that bridge for language development and communication, right? And that's going to make all the difference. Kids with hearing parents, kids with deaf parents, eventually once they have uh, language access, as long as they're provided love and some communication and some effort at the beginning, they end up with the same outcomes. So here's a good example of chaining. The sign for car. Finger spelling C-A-R the printed English word for car, the sign for car again. The sign for train. Spelling T-R-A-I-N. And then the printed word train. And again, the sign for train. So you see, first we have the signed in ASL and then the English finger spelling along with the picture. Then the printed word, then the ASL. <laughs> and the finger spelling was sort of between the sign and the printed word to create that link. All right, we're back on the right slide. So we talked about finger spelling. Now let's talk about hand shapes. These are, these are our most basic hand shapes that we use with our ECE kids from infants. And in the, the really tiny kid classes, we do poems and we play games and they tend to use first these uh, hand shapes, the five Basco one. And remember, right now, this is the time when hearing children or speaking children are developing their vocal tracks, and a lot of that comes later. But babies who sign and point and indicate and gesture, the first hand shapes that they're really able to develop, these are the easiest ones for them to use. So this one, the bent V hand shape, is a tough one, but these are very easy for, for the little ones. And so we use these hand shapes for a lot of different things. And I'm sure you've seen these in your ASL classes and your teachers have shown you these ad nauseum. You should be pretty familiar for that, with that. So this is playing with one hand shape. And this is the sign for fall is in the season of autumn. So this is trees. And oh, it's all oh, and leaves falling and raking into a big pile, and the wind blowing. So you can see these. 
And this is like, you know, hearing people who have nursery rhymes and this sort of rhythm and sing songiness. This is a very similar thing, except it's not sound based. It's a phonology and a rhythm and rhyming that's based on hand shapes and the phonology of ASL, but it's the same parameters, the same idea, except instead of using the vocal tract, we're using different parts of the body. This next one's one of my favorites. So my name is Dave, and I use signs based on D-A-V-E. D, let's see, sneaking in somewhere, being aggressive, and then being stuck. It's an emergency. So this is kids using the letters of their names to create poetry. So here's the kid giving their name. <laughs> this is Nate. These are going very quickly. They're a little blurry, so please forgive me for not fully interpreting all of them. <laughs> this is so Talia. And her her story, Talia's story, involved a, a sibling who wanted to play with a toy, and uh, Talia sort of declining that request. So we've talked about fingerspelling and hand shapes. Now let's look at location. Now this is a location dance that shows different locations where signs typically occur. And this is again, the same concept of a nursery rhyme. We have one hand shape going to different locations. <clears throat> so suppose this was reversed and the location stayed the same when we use different hand shape, breakfast, lunch, dinner, one wrong, yell, all one location, but the hand shapes change. And that's something that we do with older kids. And here at the California School for the Deaf, something that we do and that we have in a lot of the different, all of the classrooms in the elementary schools, we've got the ABCs, we've got words, we've got signs, right? You're familiar with that kind of idea, but we also have location and hand shapes. So you can take it this, look at this poster and these divisions with the colors, right? <laughs> the teacher might say, okay, the sign four, as in what's that for? Where is that? And the kid would say where it is. Or this sign, where is that? It's on the green part. It's, it's uh, signed on the arm. So you can see all the way over on the side here, over all the way to the right, is this blend of ASL and English. We've got the ASL locations, but with the English translations of signs that are signed at those locations. In the old way, you know, you would finger spell and you say, no, go look in the dictionary. And then they have to look through the dictionary in English. Now we're turning that around and we're making things ASL specific so that if they need to find a word, they can think about the location and then look it up based on the location of the ASL sign. And just a moment. And this is another way that we do the location wall, All right? You can see we've got each one and then underneath we have vocabulary that has a picture and a word and a hand shape and things like that. And here's a more close up picture. 
So teachers and parents can use these two kinds of walls that incorporate English and ASL or both together. And this is just another example of the location wall. So you can see boy and lights. <clears throat> and then it's going back to the top. So we're on the head, we're on the chin, we're in neutral space. And now it goes back up to the top, back to the chin, back to neutral space. And where am I now? <laughs> All right, so now we'll talk about rhythm. I'll give you some examples of that. <laughs> Colors, animals, red, worm, orange, bison, yellow. So you can see these are all uh, hand shapes, right? <laughs> so children are playing with language by learning these rhythms. Ooh, and I'm looking at the time, we've got to get moving. Okay, so let's cut down to the nitty gritty. What do we do at CSD? And I've got to emphasize here, our favorite bilingual curriculum approach comes from, let's see, this one, the Fountas and Pinal Literacy Continuum. It's a lot of print, it's a lot of words, but it is amazing. So our bilingual arts program, oh, hold on, something's going on and the interpreter has lost the screen. There we go. So as you can see, uh, on one side we have ASL strategies and on the green side we have English strategies. So if you look at the green side, that's coming from this, from this book, from this resource. And it's in print and language, and it's all pretty much the same for every language, you know, but it's very uh, auditorily based. But in terms of literacy, there's things that we can take and that we can adapt for what we do. And it's not totally perfect, but we do really well with it. And we use this from about kindergarten to fifth grade. <clears throat> And if you look down at the very bottom of the green here, it says phonics, spelling, and word study. And those are the same, but except we use ASL phonology, right? You've got sound-based units, has one sort of concept of a phoneme. In ASL, we have the five parameters. And so you can study the two of those in parallel, as you can see from the white being the ASL and the green and the English. They're very similar. And so the green, you know, this is writing, people, they write about their uh, reading experience. <laughs> and for ASL, they write about what they're seeing in ASL in English. So they're watching an ASL text and then writing about that. And they can also sign about what they're watching. <laughs> so we use these, these parallel approaches at CSD in kindergarten and elementary. Again, I love this company. It's Fountas and Pinnell Literacy Continuum. <clears throat> and they have a ton of stuff for different uh, disciplines. So we've got this one too on guided reading. And that guided reading part, we also do guided viewing. 
and they've got books that look at every level and every literacy skill. Honestly, in the, my 25 years of work, this is like my favorite curriculum. So I will let you know that. I will advertise that. Fountas and Pinnell Literacy, literacy Series. Okay. So now let's look at what we do in our classrooms. So if you look at the bottom there, guided reading. So it involves English and ASL, but the guided reading time with the teacher, <laughs> you're looking at the English through ASL and you use ASL to give feedback on reading strategies. So you're reading, the reading obviously is done in English, but the discussion of the reading and everything is done in ASL, and then you use English to write about the discussion in ASL. And the reason I really like this curriculum, this one and this one, is again, it emphasizes a whole spectrum, a whole range of teaching reading. It's not just teaching grammar and being focused on one thing and drilling this one thing all the way, all the time and missing the big picture, right? There's a lot of ways to get information. There's a lot of ways to process literacy. And so this really forces you to think about the big picture. <laughs> and it requires committee work and it's a time investment in curriculum development. It can take a lot of years. It's taken us a long time to get to this point. And so you can see these three columns. These are the standards that we follow for literacy. And we tend to have three. We have ASL, we have the CCSS, which are the common core state standards. Those are the six expectations that are the same for every student in the state. They're, we do not teach to a lower standard in any way. And then we have ELD, English Language Development, which is a California standard for people who are learning English as a second language. <laughs> and this is typically a standard for hearing children who have some other language, for example, Spanish, and they come to the United States and now they're in school in English, they take ELD. And that standard is tied to the common core, but it's got a slightly different pace. It's got some slightly more in-depth work, but again, it's still normed to the common core standard. And we think about these three standards all the time. We talk about ASL, our common core, plus our ELD. And so we're always looking at these three standards when we're developing our curriculum. And you can see, you know, having to do all three of these throughout all of our grades and through all of our subjects, it's, uh, it's quite a bit. And this is a little internal stuff. This is uh, what we use internally. This isn't public. <laughs> But uh, this is all of the years of development and training and everything that we've come up with, uh, we have in our own internal uh, curriculum, what we call the CIA curriculum instruction and assessment website. And we put a lot of resources here for teachers. And the main thing that we have here is ASL videos. I mean, you can find books, you can find printed materials, but ASL videos, it's uh, still a work in progress. And so we've been doing this for, you know, many, many years. And so this CIA site is a repository of a lot of videos that teachers can use in the classroom during reading time or during viewing time. And just a little reminder, another important thing that we've learned about the difference here. We've got, there's two different things here. We've got storytelling and story signing. So you might be thinking, what's the difference? I'll tell you. We know about storytelling, right? We know about telling stories in ASL, right? See the sandwich, oh, you see that? I did a sandwich technique. I said storytelling, fingerspelled it, and then talked about storytelling. And maybe that was chaining, I don't know, anyway. Uh, <laughs> I'll get off the soapbox for a second. But the point is storytelling, we're used to. We know what that looks like. 
Now, story signing is a slightly different thing, and I'll tell you why that is. You're signing in ASL and storytelling, it's just sort of independent, free form. It's not tied to any other text, right? You're just telling the story, giving the information. Maybe it's a story, oral tradition type of story you heard from your parents and been passed down through the deaf school for decades. Now, story signing involves tying it to another source, whether it's a movie or a book, but it's something that potentially has English that you are referring back to. And so we'll, we'll think about the five little monkeys, right? That was story signing. Remember the video of the little girl? She was referring to the book of the five little monkeys and we had the book presented with the signs. And so I will go through a little bit about what uh, that means for us. So this is storytelling. The first thing I'm gonna show you, there's no other text, there's no printed English. It's just someone telling a story. There's a kid, he's got his backpack on, he's waiting and sees a van coming down the street. And that is not my boss. So the kid is standing there and waiting and looks down the street and sees a truck. So that's just an example of storytelling, right? Just signing a story. And these are some other storytelling examples right? Just signing, no real particular backdrop, just telling a story and time is short, so I'm not going to show you all of these. Well, I guess we'll get into one. So, storytelling. Storytelling, these are some of the parameters of storytelling and why we use them. Now, story signing, you can see here, we're looking to build vocabulary, to put in elaboration, to add background knowledge. And sometimes with storytelling, you do have the background, but with story signing, you might have these things uh, print in the back. And so you do have this, uh, this ASL portion, but because you're tying it to the text, this is story signing. So you see the text of Five Little Monkeys along with the ASL there. <sighs> this is our school library staff here. This is our, these are our librarians telling a story. And it's story signing because it's got the print. And so here they're playing the two different characters that we see in behind. And they're signing the story that's printed <laughs> as well as acting it out. Out on the street they fought, down the stairs they fought. So these are our awesome librarians. They also do public story signing events every Thursday. So if you want for more information for your students who are not CSD students, they are able to join. And if you contact Jack, Jack can give you some information about that. But I'm very proud of our department here. Oh, and okay. And so story signing, as you can see, can have multiple people involved. It doesn't have to be just the one person. And one of the great victories of our K through 12 program here is that our older students do story signing for our elementary students. So we have high school students who do these and make these videos for the elementary students. It's so heartwarming. And you can see this is still story signing because we have the book in the background. But this is kind of a cool one. Check this out.
It's the three little pigs. Always do your best and you'll succeed. If you just hang back and don't really try, you won't succeed. So here's the three pigs. And they found the perfect place to build their houses. The first pig thought, I'll use hay. Built the house, was satisfied, went into play. The second pig saw a tree and built a house out of sticks, thought that's good enough, I'm gonna go and play. The third pig, bricks, etc. So you can see this one was uh, had some English. Now this next one's a little more stylized. This kid is great. And you see the English uh, comes up sort of as captions underneath. So if you look at what families can do, what you can do at home, this is the list here. The middle one, find a deaf BFF and please do. We're around, there's deaf BFFs around. We've got over 35 million deaf Americans, so you should not have a problem finding one deaf BFF who can sign very well with you and your kids. <laughs> and let's we'll close with something here that people are, are doing at home right now. says, I love you, Grandma. And you see how she points to the text? And he signs Grandma. And she says, what does this say? I love you, Grandma. <clears throat> so that kid is older, not really looking at the pictures much, looking a lot at the words. Is that me? That's me. And that's you. Yeah, that's me, Grandma. And they are eating breakfast. Grass, I see grass. Yeah, they're eating berries. The little bear asked, and on the side, of course, we have uh, <laughs> an explanation of what some of the strategies are. So you have the deaf grandma. Now here we have a hearing mother with a little kid and you can see you know, the kid already has this uh, deaf peripheral vision, doesn't need to turn around to look at mom, is catching things out of the corner of their eye. Oh. Right, that's right, it's a lion. That's right. Where's the lion? And the baby points. So do a minimum of 20 minutes a day at home reading. You know, you can have posters in your home that encourage your kids to read. Give them a reward. The bottom line is the best readers read and the best readers sign at home all the time. And we have generations of successful, deaf, bilingual readers. And we have a huge number of deaf adults with hearing children. And they all grow up to be successful readers as well. The point is to keep practicing and stressing literacy skills at home, and this is something that you can do. And there it is. You can do it. And there are resources at the end of these slides that I will send out to everyone. And I think, whoo. 1057, goodness. Okay, turn it back over to Jack. Wow, there's so many different strategies there. 
and you know Dave gave out so much and core has so many great resources and I see in the chat box just a lot of questions and discussions and people desiring more information and so you know the question is you know how can we make a wall how can we do some of these things where we are and we are going to put together some links some resources um, and some books like uh, Dave showed here. So we can try to put that together and some links along with this recording to send out to all of you. And a lot of what Dave was talking about in each of these sections all relate to the things that we talked about in previous webinars. And so if you haven't had a chance to watch some of the previous webinars related to language acquisition, that critical uh, language age, language acquisition before the age of three, and how parents can be involved in that. You, that uh, explains a lot of data and a lot of research there. So please do go back and look at some of those previous webinars. And a lot of that research, you know, those research and the researchers, they have just these amazing, you know, sort of dry charts and graphs, but the, the stories behind them and the way that they bring those uh, to us in a way that's easy to digest is just fantastic. And so I really do suggest going back and looking at some of that and they'll bring you even greater understanding of Dave's literacy presentation. And a lot of it is about building confidence for families. Maybe people feel like they don't sign well themselves. Parents feel like they don't sign well, but you can still be involved. You can still help build, build these skills with your children. And so this is something we're reminding you, but it's a great reminder for ourselves as well, you know, ways to change my old thought patterns and things that I used to think, you know, in terms of interacting with families, you know, or as a teacher in the classroom, being able to sign with students. So I just, ah, oh, Dave. Yeah, I just want to add my department is your resource for Northern California. Right. And of course, we're happy to share with anyone. But my department, you know, we go around, we do trainings, you know, once things settle down with COVID, obviously. But, you know, if you want some specific training, we've got a ton of stuff. I'm happy to come to your district. I'm happy to get local families together and build those relationships because we're all on the same page. We want to get this bilingual approach going for everyone. Right. I know teachers, we want to reduce your frustration. Families, we want to reduce your frustration. You know, we've been doing this for over 25 years. We have a lot of expertise on our staff and we want to share that with you. Yeah, and over those years, it's all continued to grow and change and shift. And so we really like to see that expansion and that spiraling. So, you know, we don't just want to be you to be stuck and to be isolated in your own little bubble, right? And we don't want to keep this to ourselves. You know, we're doing this to benefit deaf students and the families of deaf children. Okay. I want to very quickly respond to a few of these questions. Hopefully you can all see me. Let's see. Why do I? see me. Can you see me? I thought, did we lose Dave? Oh boy, what's going on? Okay, okay, good, okay. I'm listening to Roberto, but okay, so, okay. Okay, we will send out all of this information on the recording. I do have three questions. I've got one from Canada. Uh, it says, I'm from Canada. We also want to share ASL apps that are available through Google Play. We are looking for people and agencies to try out the apps and share feedback with our lab team. Our webpage is 
dot sign the number two read dot com. Contact Dr. Lynn McQuarrie for more information. Email is contact at sign the number two read dot com. And it's so great to be sharing these resources. So with the webinars going forward, you know, like I said, you know, with CORE, we want to be able to share these things and we want to get the things that are the most important for you. We want to hit the topics and things that you want, you know, <clears throat> and we want to talk about classroom observation, teaching the teachers, curriculum development, curriculum specialists. Um, but if there's trainings and things that you want, you know, this new way we're doing things with Zoom and not having to be in person, we're able to get this information out to people outside of our area, outside of the state, from everywhere. It's so cool to see so many different kinds of people joining our webinars. Someone from Canada, this is awesome. And so we're so happy to be able to share this with you uh, through the webinar. Uh, there is a question here uh, right at the beginning. If there's any research on the trends for deaf and hard of hearing kids from Spanish speaking families learning language, either English or ASL or both. Do you have an answer for that, Dave? research, nothing I can think of off the top of my head. However, you know, here in California, we have a high number of Spanish speaking families. And over time through, you know, doing outreach classes and things for families, what we see is whether the families know English or not, they should go ahead and learn ASL and still apply these same techniques. For families that do Spanish and know ASL, then those kids who come out of that environment actually learn English faster. Um, and again, it's very similar parameters and very similar timelines. So what I would say is for Spanish speaking families, the parents who are hearing and speak Spanish, don't speak English, that's fine. The kids will get English later. This is not necessarily language dependent. Just keep signing and gesturing. You can try using uh, Mexican Sign Language. Um, whatever it is, just go for it, you know? And if the family signs really in any language or speaks any language, you know, that that's what's important. Uh, if they don't do anything with the kids, those kids will struggle learning with literacy skills. But the whole point is just open up a book, start picking up your hands, and, you know, the kids here teach each other as well. Here at CSD, you know, we're a very old deaf school, and we're all still learning every day. And the attitude that we have here is that this is a learning community. We're all learning together. So go ahead and do what you can. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. That was beautiful. Okay. I see a question here that says, can teachers borrow all of these uh, ideas for their own classrooms outside of California, other states, other countries, or can we use these resources? Sure. Uh, one thing, you know, last year, we did a training for a deaf community in Brazil uh, based on this, this curriculum. And we had to change it for Portuguese. Uh, and we had some very poor Portuguese printed materials. So my mistake on it. it was tough. I was trying to bring things down to this training in Brazil for a deaf school there, but it was very good. It was cool. It was down in Rio de Janeiro last year, and they've started using this approach, right? It's just about switching out the language, but you can absolutely use this. And so they use this uh, for Libras and, you know, the whole point is this is not like our private proprietary thing. We want you all to have this, right? Um, now, can I go do trainings out of state? I don't know. That's kind of technology dependent at this point. Yeah, and that's why these webinars are so great. And something to reinforce before we wrap up is this idea that you had about, you know, Brazil and bringing this to Brazil and showing them the books and everything. And that's really neat because, you know, Brazil, they have their own true language, right? And the thing is, is you can teach these in any curriculum, right? 
uh, and maybe they don't necessarily have these curriculums in their language. But if you go to a conference, if you go to a place where there's a bunch of teachers, you can use this with Brazilian Sign Language just like ASL. So the, the idea of this approach, as long as it's translated into a language that is usable in that country, the concepts apply to any language pairs. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And like I said, this is, this is great, this book, but it, the work was finding the parallels in ASL to find the things that were visual, right? Because that's not in this written curriculum. Um, and we put a lot, you know, thousands of dollars into this, getting the levels right for each age and each kid and everything. And so, you know, it was a very intensive process and we just put a lot into figuring out how to get these, how to get this to work in ASL because we already use ASL to teach literacy, right? We turn a book around, we sign, we do these things. But it's also about continuing that vocabulary development. And it is, it's about getting the community together to develop these resources, sharing apps, sharing the work that we do, right? And you, you can't just buy this book and follow what the book does, right? That's not what we're doing. There's a lot more behind it. Well, again, Dave, thank you so much for your time. It's such really valuable information. And I look forward to your involvement in our webinars and bringing this whole list of resources and videos and sharing that with the rest of our learning community. I hope you have a good weekend and we will see you all later. Bye.